Hello everyone. Today's case revolves around a missing teen who vanished from East Coast Canada after hanging out with a group of criminal friends that his family didn't even know he was involved with. This is a case that has gotten little to no coverage over the last two years since it happened, but today we are going to help change that. In the months leading up to 16-year-old Devin Sinclair Marsman's disappearance from the city of Halifax, Nova Scotia, his mother, Teresa Gray, didn't notice much of a change in him. He was born and raised in the Maritime Province along the Atlantic Ocean and was the youngest with a sister around 18 years old and a brother around 37 years old who he was very close with. Devin was said to be a very calm, polite kid who never got into trouble. He was very sociable and a jokester and he loved to pull pranks. Teresa would end up going on a podcast called Nighttime Podcast, which I'll have linked down below if you want to go check it out. But this is what she had to say about her son. And growing up, like what, what was he into? Like what, what would you say as Devin's hobbies or what occupied his time? Being? Devin occupied his time with he loved to watch movies and whatever movie he watched, he thought I should watch also. <laughs> So he'd finish a series and then he'd come down and he put the series on for me, whether I wanted to watch it or not. <laughs> but it always seemed that it was a good series. Mm -hmm. He liked to play his video games. He, yeah, played basketball outside with his friends. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what was your relationship like with Devin? Mine and Devin's relationship, honestly, is like super super close Devin never left my house without telling me he loved me mm -hmm. you know I could lay on the couch and he'd bring me a blanket he's like mom I think you're cold I'm like no I'm not cold he'd bring me a blanket like always asked me if I needed something or wanted something mm -hmm. like very caring like super caring yeah yeah well I think like with my kids I always try to make it so that if they have a problem they're going to be comfortable talking to me about it not kind of hiding from me like if do you think if, if Devin had like personal issues going on in his life was your relationship the way that he'd be comfortable being like mom you know this is going on most definitely most yeah. definitely I mean I did everything with Devin and my other kids also I mean I never even took them to a playground that I'd sit there and say okay you guys can play down the end of the playground if they went to the end of the playground yeah. I went to the end of the playground yeah I never took family vacations without taking him mm -hmm. like or taking both of them mm -hmm. Like, yeah, like I used to tell them, you know, there's no golden spoons. You guys get what I get because I work and I made sure that, you know, they always had mm -hmm. everything that I could give them. However, Teresa also knew that Devin was smoking pot like a lot of teenagers tend to do. And we do also have to remember it is legal in Canada, although the legal smoking age is supposed to be 19 years old. Many kids don't abide by the law, of course. But Devin, as I said, had a sense of humor. And when Teresa ended up calling him out on smoking weed, Teresa said that Devin ended up smirking at her and saying, and I quote, oh, mom, you should try it sometime. All my friend's parents try it, end quote. Now, Devin had also dropped out of school just before December of 2021. And this also wasn't anything that was very surprising to Teresa because Devin had been diagnosed as dyslexic in ninth grade. So he often struggled in school and she said that he was too proud to ask for help. So the school seemed to kind of give him an ultimatum and then he left to pursue other avenues. So it wasn't like he was kicked out of school for bad behavior or anything along those lines. He simply had a learning problem. And honestly, traditional school isn't set up to, you know, aid in helping people that can't learn a certain way. The traditional school system is definitely designed that you have to learn one way and if you can't then it's kind of like best luck to you. And I do have a strong belief that, you know, traditional school isn't for everyone. But this meant that Devin was home a lot now. And he seemed to kind of have a routine where he stayed up quite late at night. He'd watch a lot of movies. Sometimes he'd play Call of Duty on his PlayStation 4. And then he'd sleep during the majority of the day. Teresa saying, and I quote, he would stay up all night long. He'd watch movies and then he'd sleep most of the day. There were days when Devin didn't even get out of the house end quote. And honestly, he reminds me a lot of my little brother. He also had a lot of issues um, with school. And, and so he ended up dropping out and then basically staying at home and spending a lot of time either playing video games or just, you know, staying up very late. And he was around the exact same age as Devin when this happened. So I can relate. However, February 23rd of 2022 would be the last day that Devin would ever be seen by his mother again. The next morning, which was a Thursday, Teresa would get up early and go to work and Devin was still fast asleep in bed. However, when she arrived home, Devin was not there anymore and she just assumed he was at a friend's house, which was something that Devin also would do. If he wasn't sleeping in late, he'd kind of be in and out of the house all day, going to friends' houses, coming back, maybe for lunch, going back out. So it wasn't, you know, completely odd that Devin wasn't home when she got home. However, Devin would never come home again, and he actually wouldn't be reported missing until March 5th, nearly two weeks after he disappeared. 
Now, from everything that I've seen, Teresa at first thought, again, Devin was just at a friend's house. But when a couple days ended up passing and he did not contact her, he didn't answer any of her messages or her calls, she went and tried to report him missing. Now, my best guess is we see this quite often happening in cases. The police don't want to immediately file a missing persons report. They usually want to go with the line of thinking that the person just ran away and they'll come back. However, when they eventually don't come back after a longer period of time, they're kind of like, oh shit we should probably look into this. And that kind of seems what may have happened here. Now, the issue with that is the first 48 hours are the most important. So when someone goes to report their loved one missing and the police don't take it seriously right away, that is precious time that is being lost. Once two weeks have passed, the case is gonna be a lot harder to solve. Evidence can be destroyed. If the person was kidnapped somewhere, they could have been taken across the world in that point of time. If this person has been murdered, it's given the killers an ample amount of time to get rid of the evidence and get rid of the body. It's honestly awful when this happens. Now here's where things get strange because it turns out that Devin was allegedly alive and well on the 24th and 25th of February. It would be determined that later on in the day on Thursday, February 24th, Devin was actually at a friend's house in Clayton Park with his cousin who is 23 year old Trayton Marsman and a 16 year old named Austin. We don't know what they were doing at this apartment or what was going on that day, but we do know that later on the 24th, the three of them would then travel to Trayton's house in Spryfield, which is located at 17 Gallic Court in the McIntosh Run Estates, which was a newer suburb at the time in the Spryfield area of Halifax. Now, despite this being a newer suburb, it was placed in an area that was known to be a low income area, which had a lot of gun violence and gang activity, according to locals. But things would get even stranger because the next day on the 25th, police would confirm through a taxi record log that Devin had called a taxi to pick him up at his cousin Trayton's house. The taxi would pick him up around 12.30 p.m. and take him to Romans Avenue, which is a street right by Devin's house. However, despite being dropped off right by his home, Devin didn't go home. There was also a very bad snowstorm that day, and no one knows what Devin did for six or more hours after being dropped off on Robins Avenue. Considering the temperatures and how severe the weather was, it's not likely he was outside for that period of time. He really enjoyed playing basketball, and he played at a local basketball court quite often. However, again, a snowstorm isn't, you know, the time to play basketball. People are definitely not playing basketball in a snowstorm. <laughs> However, at 7 p.m. that day, Devin called another taxi and ordered it from the local basketball court back to his cousin's house. And it's alleged that a taxi driver did confirm that he watched Devin walk into Trayton's home. Now, police allowed Teresa to listen to these taxi phone calls and she did confirm that that was Devin's voice. And they're also very sure, like 99.9% .9 sure that he was with Trayton and Austin that day. Again. And here's the thing, both his cousin Trayton and this kid named Austin, which we don't know much about, honestly, what we do know is that they allegedly have extensive criminal records involving violence and drug trafficking. However, Despite all of this information, when Trayton was interviewed, he allegedly told multiple different stories. The very first one being that he claimed Devin wasn't there at all those nights. However, in a completely different story, Trayton would allege that they were together at Clayton Park that day. However, when they left, they went their separate ways. In a completely different story, he alleged they did go back to his home in Spryfield. However, when they went to sleep and woke up in the morning, Devin wasn't there anymore. In a fourth story, Trayton allegedly said that they went back to his house, played video games, wrestled and then went to a neighbor's and then we don't know what happened after that. Also keep in mind that this cousin was eight years older than Devin. Devin was a minor. He was 16 years old, hanging out with a 23 year old. Now I understand cousins can hang out, but when this cousin is an extremely bad influence that's involved with all of this alleged criminal activity, this wasn't just like a casual cousin hangout, it seemed. And again, I just find it weird that a 23 year old would want to hang out with minors with two 16 year olds. Like, why wouldn't you want to be hanging out with people your own age? And that makes me wonder if he was hanging out with minors because they're, you know, more easily influenced. And it seems like Trayton, from what we will learn, we'll talk about some of his um, alleged charges and stuff that I found, but it seems like he was involved with stuff like that. A lot of people that are involved with stuff like that, again, want to get minors or people that are going to be easily influenced that they can mold to think certain ways and to do certain things. And it's just terrible. It's terrible all around. And I just find it, I do find it weird. At 23 years old, I was not wanting to hang out with 16 year olds, family or not. Now I'm going to play for you another clip of Teresa on the nighttime podcast. And this is her talking about the timeline. How could one minute he's not with you and then the next minute your story changes, right? And, and I don't believe either of these two have given their story like publicly. I'm, I'm guessing the various stories you get are either through family or through the police. Right. Like I've never seen, despite their names being so connected to the case, I've never seen them with an interview on TV or on the news or newspaper or anything. 
nothing. The only reason I know about these stories is because when Devin didn't return home on that Thursday mm -hmm. and then a couple days had went by and the boy next door, he said to my daughter, oh, Devin was at my brother's house in Clayton Park. He came there with Austin and Trayton. Mm -hmm. So right away, Devin's father, Richie, he called his nephew, Trayton's father, and he said he wanted Trayton to call him. So he calls him and he says, where's Devin? First of all, he wasn't with Devin. He never seen Devin, like, at all. Mm -hmm. And then when he knew that, you know, well, you were last night with him, you know, in Clayton Park, the story started changing. You know, we left there. We went our own separate ways. Then the next story was, you know, we went back to my house. We went to sleep. Devin was gone. Mm -hmm. But the stories just keep changing. He's never once ever called my house, ever, mm -hmm. to say, you know, did you hear from Devin? Did you find Devin? His father, his mother, they have never called my house. And when Richie reached out to his nephew to say, you know, you got to get Trayton's mother, you know, like to pressure him, her response, she's not getting involved. Well, I'm sorry, you're already involved. And according to Teresa, and I quote, Trayton is into drugs, into human trafficking, and prostituting girls, end quote. In 2018, he would also be arrested and charged with obstructing a peace officer after a highway incident. And a month later, he was in the news again for assaulting a man at a bar. And as you can see, the 2018 charge there made news because we have photos of him doing a perp walk. Now, Teresa would later find out that Devin had probably been hanging out with his cousin Trayton for around a year behind his mother's back. However, if Devin was involving himself in his cousin's shady dealings, he wasn't really reaping the benefits from it. Because according to Teresa, she cleaned Devin's room regularly and she never found any items or flashy gifts like gold chains or money. Devin didn't have a job. So if she started suddenly finding stuff in his room like that or seeing him coming up with new clothing or fancy things, like she would have noticed. And whenever Devin needed money, he would ask his mom for money. Teresa talked about an example of, you know, sometimes Devin would be on the way home and he'd ask her, if she could send him, you know, like $20 so he could pick up some fries to bring home. But what's really scary about all of this is that Teresa, it seems for the most part, did everything a mother could have done. She was involved with her son. He didn't show any signs of change that you'd usually expect when someone's hanging out with a shadier crowd. Again, he didn't seem to be coming home with anything that would make her think he was involving himself with, you know, the shadier side of life. Yet Devin seemed to be living a double life at 16 years old. He had one group of friends that his parents and family knew of that all seemed to be great kids. And then he had the separate group of extremely bad influences he was hanging out with. And it makes me wonder if he was hanging out with them, but wasn't involved in the bad stuff. And that's why he wasn't coming home with, you know, wads of cash or anything like that. But sometimes that's not great either because honestly, something happens and you're around. They don't trust you. Something bad could happen. And could that be what happened here? In the days following Devin's disappearance, Teresa tried relentlessly texting him, calling him, but she got no response. But she was determined to find her little boy, even if the police didn't seem like they were very worried. She went all across Nova Scotia, posting flyers and searching for her son to no avail. And it's been just over exactly two years since Devin disappeared. And there have been multiple different rallies that they've held. They've done vigils. They've posted flyers. She's tried to promote this on social media and she's tried calling news networks works, but no one wants to talk about Devin's disappearance. And it's awful. I don't know why some cases don't get covered and some do. This is a 16 year old kid who vanished without a trace. It deserves to be talked about. And in the time that Devin has last been seen, his case has hit every single one of the bad signs that someone did not run away or go somewhere on their own free will. He hasn't used his phone. He hasn't used his social media. His bank accounts have been completely inactive. He hasn't contacted his family, his friends. He has been radio silent since the 25th of February in 2022. His cell phone has also never been found. And as far as we know, it last pinged on February 25th. However, the location of that ping has never been released. It wouldn't be until October of 2022 when police would finally deem Devin's disappearance suspicious coming forward saying that they did believe there were individuals who may have information that have not come forward. And as far as I seen, they deemed his disappearance suspicious after they searched his cousin Trayton's home. Now, as we hear in so many of these Canadian cases, Teresa is extremely frustrated with the lack of information surrounding Devin's case, how slow police seem to be working on it. And she seems to have lost faith in the police's ability to find her son saying, and I quote, I don't understand if they know where Devin was and they know who he was with, it shouldn't be two years. 
end quote. On top of that, which this makes me very frustrated, she says they've never searched Devin's computer, his iPod, his PlayStation 4, which were all devices he regularly used to communicate with his friends through, which there could be vital evidence on there. Maybe he said something to someone. Police have also allegedly never accessed his social media accounts either to try to find information on that. Now, I don't know in the last two years now if they have, but they did not do it immediately if so. And it's honestly all very strange to me that they would not want to access that information. On top of that, in the weeks after Devin disappeared, Teresa claims that two of the lead investigators began sending her photos of children and none of them even looked like Devin and she began to question if they even knew what he looked like. It just seems like they they weren't really putting in effort, kind of just throwing things on the wall and seeing if anything stuck. But it would get worse from there. An article from Saltwire wrote, and I quote, two lead investigators assigned to the case in the beginning have since been replaced. One officer had written several posts on a Facebook page devoted to finding Devin. The officer was defending investigators' handling of the case. Devin's mom said she got a call from another officer screaming at her after she contacted the department with concerns about how the case was being handled end quote. So essentially there is a Facebook page for Devin. If you want to go follow it, I'll also have it down below. But one of these investigators went onto that page and began defending the investigation in the comment section of the posts, which is completely unprofessional in my opinion. But people were pissed. Of course, as, as you see, it seems like they're not really doing their best effort in my opinion to investigate here, especially if they're not looking through things, they weren't looking for him immediately either, which again, they seem to have all of this information that he was at his cousin's house last and his cousin has 20,000 different stories, yet he's not a person of interest. He's not a suspect. He's not nothing. It's very odd. So of course, a lot of people are gonna go and vent online about this, especially his family and friends. They have a Facebook page. They're all you know communicating on there about his case. And then this investigator just shows up in the comment section being like, no, we're doing all we can. Like it's it's just, it's so unprofessional. So he was kicked off the, the case basically. And then of course, again, Teresa is pissed because it seems like they're not doing much. So she calls the department concerned about the investigation and, you know, continually to ask like, do you have information? Do you have new information? Like what is going on? And then this other investigator calls her back screaming at her for trying to figure out where her son is. It's just completely unprofessional. And so of course that person was kicked off the case as well. It's just what is going on here? It's just a complete injustice to Devin. This kid needs to be found and everyone is just kind of fucking around in my opinion. The Canadian cases really make me mad. They really, they really frustrate me and piss me off sometimes because as much issues there are in the American justice system, the Canadian justice system, as someone who lives here, it's just, it seems like another level. Just from all these cases that I've ever covered, just from everything I kind of know and hear, it's just, it just pisses me off. And the, I continue to cover these cases and work with families that are in the Canadian justice system. And it's just, it's ridiculous. And it really hurts my heart that these families have to go through this and that these people who are missing, who may be out there held captive or who knows where, waiting to be saved, waiting to be found. And this is what's happening behind the scenes. We have officers argue on Facebook, like go investigate. Now we do have some kind of lead, I guess, because one of the only leads that police seem to have is a missing Apple AirPod earbud. Now, it seems like one of Devin's was located at his home. However, his other earbud is missing. And it took a while, apparently, for them to figure out that they could track it. So I guess they were supposed to try to track this earbud and see if it led to answers of where Devin may be. Because if he was murdered and is buried somewhere, maybe it's in his pocket and they'll be able to trace it that way. Now, I don't know if they could do that when the AirPods is dead because it doesn't have a battery life. Again, if they had started investigating earlier, figured this out earlier, it may still have had battery power and they might have been able to trace it. However, this was as far as I see back in 2023 and I haven't seen any updates on any of that if they were able to track it, which again, if it doesn't have battery, I wonder if they wouldn't be able to then. Now, police have also, as I said, allegedly searched Trayton's home, but they ended up telling Teresa that they can't speak on any of the evidence recovered due to it being part of the investigation. Now, after this, both Teresa and Devin's father ended up submitting their DNA. However, they still have no answers on what was found inside of Trayton's home, but it does lead family to believe that they must have found something in Trayton's home that proved that Devin was there or else why wouldn't they just say that they didn't find any evidence? Like they clearly said they can't talk about what they found because it involves the investigation. So clearly they must have found something, right? And if they did find something that meant Devin was there, 
why isn't anything moving? Police would also end up deploying a dive team in an area of water called Roach's Pond, which is only a three minute drive from Trayton's home. As you can see on the map here, it is extremely close. It's pretty much in the backyard of this housing development. And there also seems to be a river that runs nearby or through the development as well. Now, when it comes to this dive team searching this body of water, police once again would not give the family any information on if they found anything or not. And all they seem to tell Teresa every time she contacts them is, and I quote, the investigation is moving forward, end quote, which what does that mean? Moving forward apparently has been two years with no answers. But the crowd that Devin was associating himself with would come into the spotlight once again on December 15th of 2022. Because around 9.30 that day, a search team of locals looking for Devin called police to report secondhand information on a man named Marquette Sinclair Simmons. Now Marquette had been witnessed driving around Halifax intoxicated and had posted on social media as well as was in text conversations conspiring to kill multiple people. One text stated that he wanted to shoot a woman named Ashley Hill in the head, who was a girlfriend of a man named Shaquan Marcel Upshaw Paris, who owed him money for a job he completed for him. But what was even more shocking was in another text message, Marquette mentioned that there was going to be a shooting at a home on North Green Road in the Lakeside area at 3.30 p.m. And this address was the home of Trayton. Devin's cousin. Now Marquette would eventually end up being arrested. Police would find multiple illegal weapons on him and in his home. But as you can see, the people that Devin was associating himself with around the time of his disappearance were not good people. People that apparently are going to go and shoot up and murder multiple people because they're not getting paid for jobs that they're doing, what these jobs are clearly are worth killing people over, it seems. And these clearly were not good people. This was not a good environment for a 16 year old boy, especially like Devin, who seemed to be very sweet, very nice, very impressionable to be involved with. But it just keeps leading to the question of why was Devin involving himself with people like this? And if he was, did they have something to do with his disappearance? Now there have been a lot of rumors floating around regarding Devin's disappearance random people contacting Teresa and telling her things. And there are rumors such as Devin had been shot inside the Spryfield residence, which was his cousin Trayton's home after he was dropped off by that taxi. Others say he was buried in McIntosh Run, which is the development that Trayton lived in. However, canines allegedly searched the area and didn't find any scent. Another person came forward saying Devin overdosed and was thrown in a lake. However, the lakes were all frozen over at that time. So it is kind of strange if he was thrown into a body of water where that would have been because it was the middle of winter and pretty much everywhere in the maritime is frozen and there are other rumors as well that Devin was set on fire or murdered and then burned basically Devin's 18th birthday has come and gone and we are still no closer to finding him Justice for Devin! it's Devin Marsman's 18th birthday Justice! the second one his family has had to celebrate without him it's not fair like he deserves to be home Devin went missing in February 2022 and was last seen in Spryfield. A year ago, Halifax Regional Police deemed the teen's disappearance suspicious. Now, nearly two years later, not much has changed in the investigation. We are following up on all leads that we get. We're following up on all the tips that we get. And again, we know there's people out there that have that information. But for his family, that isn't enough. Halifax Regional Police, do better. This is someone's son. This is someone's family member. It's, it's sickening that it's been over 500 days and nothing has come to light. I feel enough is not being done because everything that comes out about Devin, I put it in motion. Teresa Gray says she has stopped at nothing to find her son. I mean, you know, we're searching like dead end roads. We're searching like junk piles. I mean, it was, it was the winter, you know, it was a major snowstorm. So if they did something to him, he's not going to be under the ground. Like, he's going to be somewhere. But on Devin's 18th birthday and on the eve of Thanksgiving, family and friends are doing all they can to keep his name out there. And so we are praying for a miracle, Lord, that Devin will return to us soon. When Jesus is the there remains a $150,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of those responsible for his disappearance. But he's not going to be forgotten. I'm going to find Evan. And, you know, until there's an arrest or I find my son, I won't stop. 
Now, Teresa believes that her son would not have unalived himself. And, you know, usually with cases, it's like, okay, of course the family's not going to think that. A lot of times people don't show signs that, you know, they're, they're planning to do something like that. However, this is a case where I'm like 99.9% .9 sure that that is not what happened here. Now, when it comes to Teresa's theories, her theories do sway towards that Trayton and his group of friends may have tried to pressure Devin into doing something illegal or something he didn't want to do. So they ended up taking him out because he knew too much. And Evan's case currently has a $150,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of those responsible for his disappearance. I'm gonna have Devin's picture on the screen once again here. Devin is described as of mixed African Nova Scotian descent, standing five feet tall, about 100 pounds, with blue green eyes and short dark hair. If you have any information, I'll also have a number down below in the description for you to contact or send tips in. But as always, make sure it is credible information. Now, what I do wonder is if this does run extremely deep with drugs and gangs as it seems to be. It does make me wonder if police are piecing together an even bigger investigation than we know of than even just Devin going missing. And that is why it seems like Devin's case has been thrown in the back burner and they're kind of focusing on other things. I've also seen suggested that it's possible that the police have informants in some of these circles and they don't want to compromise their informants, which is why they're not pressing forward as hard as they should be. On the other hand, I personally feel just from the information that we do have, like it seems like this case was kind of fucked up from the start by police. And now it's basically gone cold because police didn't do what they needed to do in the first few days. Like the most important time frame, you know, they lost out on DNA they could have gotten. There could have been surveillance video that they could have gotten that maybe got overwritten. You know, people's memories are fresher when things happen right away. And it also could have given more time to cover up what may have happened. And here's the thing, I know not every police force is bad. I know not every cop is bad. However, it does seem like a majority of these Canadian cases that I cover, it's always the same song and dance from the police. They don't want to investigate. When they do have to investigate, they don't find much evidence. And what they do find, they keep very hush-hush. They don't want to mention anyone's names, even though in my opinion, how are you supposed to send in tips if you don't know who's involved in the case? Maybe someone does know the person that's involved, but they don't know that they're involved because the person's name has never been mentioned. And I've seen this happen so much with the investigations in Canada. They release literally no information. Unlike in the US cases where they kind of release a lot of stuff and then the cases seem to be solved a lot faster. Now, obviously not always. I'm not saying this is always, but the police never even released Trayton's name. It's the family that's like, this is our family. And he's involved, it seems like, allegedly. It's the family that has come out and said all of this information. It's not the police. And I understand keeping some information, you know, private is important. You know, there's certain things that the killers would know that other people wouldn't, that they need to keep close to the vest so they can find the real killer. I get it. I get it. But again, there's also other information that is extremely vital, in my opinion, that should be talked about and should be released so that cases can get solved quicker and more information can be you know, brought in. And this is one of those cases where I think having this information made public sooner would have helped better. At the end of the day, I think it's just very frustrating the way that the Canadian justice system works. But in my opinion, from everything that I've researched and read about Devin's case, I do agree with the family. And I do believe that it's most likely that something happened with Devin involving his cousin Trayton and his friend group. It's honestly what makes the most sense to me. In my opinion, whatever happened sadly probably wasn't good. Whether maybe it was something as simple as they gave him some kind of drug and he decided, okay, I'm 16, I'll, I'll give this a try. And maybe it had fentanyl in it and he overdosed. And so they ended up getting rid of his body so they didn't get in trouble. Or maybe since he was hanging out with all of these criminals, it seems like he overheard something he shouldn't have and they thought he would snitch. So they took him out. You know, he could have just been in the wrong place at the wrong time. Because as we've seen, you know, that Marquette guy was planning on going and shooting up Trayton's home. So who's to say that Devin wasn't in a situation where he wasn't supposed to be overheard something or got in the way accidentally and something happened to him. And they were like, well, got to get rid of him now. Again, when it involves circles of people like this, no one's going to want to snitch on each other. So getting a confession or tips is going to be extremely hard. Either way, the sweet boy got himself into something that was way over his head and he was not prepared for it, in my opinion. And it's awful. He was 16. He was easily influenced. He probably trusted his cousin. It was his flesh and blood. I know to be honest, he probably looked up to him. He was, you know, eight years older than him. He probably thought, you know, this guy's cool. He wasn't cool. And it was a very dangerous situation. And it's sad. It's just one of these cases where it doesn't seem there was a prevention 
besides obviously, you know, making good choices in life, but not everyone does. I made choices when I was in my early 20s to hang out with people that I'm surprised I wasn't in the wrong place at the wrong time and that I'm still here right now. I definitely could have ended up like Devin and been missing very easily with the choices that I made in my early 20s with who I trusted to be friends with. And as I said, maybe Devin didn't even realize how dangerous his cousin and his cousin's friends were. Maybe he just looked up to them and thought they were cool and he did go over there and play video games often and just hung out with them. And he wasn't actually involved in the criminal side of all of this because again, clearly it didn't seem like he was reaping any benefits from it that maybe he was in the wrong place at the wrong time and fortunately something happened to him. But what I do hope for Devin's family's sake, they eventually will get answers. This is one of those cases where I really wanna promote going and following the Facebook page, going and sharing Devin's missing persons flyer, sharing this video if you want or any other content that you find on Devin because this is a case that's not getting enough recognition. It's not getting talked about enough and his family is trying as hard as they can to get it talked about, which I am so glad I came across it. I'm so glad I'm talking about it right now, but more people need to be. It can't just be me. It can't just be a podcast. It needs to be more people out there spreading the word on this case. Someone out there knows something and all we need is one tip that may crack this. So we're going to I'll have all the information down below in the description if you do have any tips or information. Let's chat about this case down below. Please go show love to Devin's family. And as always, I hope you all stay safe out there. Please lock your windows and doors and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye.